Hello there, Drew Hannish of Whiskey Lore. It's time for another whiskey tasting. And today we are gonna dive into this beautiful bottle of Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee Whiskey. And if you're saying, wait a second, when I look at that label, I'm like, how do I know that's Nelson's Greenbrier? Well, you have to know. Um, you'll look on the shelf and it, it's kind of hard to read that, but that is actually very close to the original label that they came up with. In fact, uh, Andy Nelson, when I was talking to him, said that by law, they have to uh, put the words Tennessee whiskey somewhere uh, in a more official capacity. So they, that's really one of the only changes to this label. And then you'll see up at the top that it has uh, established in 1860. Now, uh, it's not beyond marketers to stretch things a little bit. And I don't know if they're stretching or not, but here's the thing. Uh, if you read the back, it says, uh, Charles Nelson introduced Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee Whiskey to the public in 1860. Well, he was a grocer, and so I'm, I'm supposing that he was a grocer in Nashville in 1860. Maybe that was the year that they arrived. He did not buy the distillery in Greenbrier, Tennessee until 1870, 10 years later. So he may have been sourcing some of his whiskey from this distillery at some, some point, but actually he was not sourcing the whiskey from the distillery that he ultimately purchased in 1860 because it didn't exist. Uh, a guy named Charles Palmer built that distillery up in Greenbrier, Tennessee in um, 1867. And Robertson County, where it's located, was a hotbed of distilling activity. And for those of you that think, oh, you know, Jack Daniels had to be the biggest whiskey out of Tennessee. I mean, look how, how big it is now. How could it not have been the biggest distilling uh, company in the 19th century? It wasn't because Jack didn't want to do over 99 bushels uh, at, a, at a time because he didn't want an extra excise man on the property. And George Dickel was a pretty good sized distillery, but George actually was also a grocer, the same as Charles Nelson was. In fact, their shops weren't too far from each other. And, um, you know, so he kind of wandered out there and found this distillery in Tullahoma and built it up. And, you know, they were competitors, but uh, Charles, I think, actually had the most uh, produced whiskey between the three there in the 19th century. The other thing is, is that Robertson County was blowing all the rest of them away. I mean, the, the history of Robertson County distilling is amazing, and I am working on a Tennessee history book that I will hopefully have out this year, and I will talk a lot about that because there's a lot of innovation that came out of Robertson County, and simply because Tennessee went into Prohibition early in 1909, it all just filtered away, and then they didn't come out of Prohibition uh, without basically you know, having to have Lem Motlow of Jack Daniels go in and become a member of Congress to get laws passed just so his county could produce whiskey even though you couldn't drink whiskey in the county for you know, up until just a couple of years ago. So, you know, it's just, it's absolutely fascinating, the history. But, um, so, so that's the only thing I'm going to dispute on the bottle is that it says 1860. Not sure about that date, but um, it, they weren't making, I can definitely say they weren't making Nelson's Greenbrier whiskey at that time. They were making Nelson's blended whiskey probably from outside sources when that happened. Anyway, the brothers stumbled upon a sign in Greenbrier, Tennessee, while they were going to see a butcher with their family. And that's when they were like, oh, well, we knew we had like a moonshiner or something in our, our past. We didn't realize that the guy who pretty much put Tennessee whiskey on the map across the globe was actually an ancestor of theirs. So they started their distillery back up. And if you want to hear this whole entire story, I do it on the uh, Whiskey Lore podcast, the Stories podcast, 
And I actually interview Andy Nelson, and he tells some of the story too. Fun story about Charles Nelson uh, and also how he got to Tennessee. Um, he's of German descent and his family's perilous trip across the ocean on the Helena Sloman, which was one of the early steamships, uh, which sank. And um, there's a little harrowing story that goes along with that. So if you want to check that out, he tells the story in the interview. I tell it more dramatically in the and fully because I actually found the original newspaper articles about the sinking of the ship where they got a first-hand account from the captain of the ship and he gave them his, uh, his uh, ship's log. So they had every detail known to man in there. Uh, it was fascinating. It's actually an episode about whiskey, but it, the whole first 10 minutes is nothing but the journey of the hell and the slowman because it's such a fascinating story. Yes, I'm going to nose and taste this whiskey. <laughs> Sometimes I can flap the jaws a little too much. This has uh, this is thirty dollars a bottle, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start off by saying that these guys are um, determined to keep the price of this whiskey low. Now, they ended up selling their distillery to Constellation Brands, which is a um, you know international company, and so that helps. But it also means that they're sourcing some of their whiskey as well. So this isn't one hundred percent pure out of just their distillery in Nashville, they actually have some other product coming in. It's all from Tennessee, otherwise they couldn't put Tennessee whiskey on it, but um, just so you know. And it does go through the Lincoln County process, which is sugar maple charcoal, but they took me over to the area where they do the mellowing, and it's not like Jane, Jack Daniels or George Dickel where they're putting it through feet of sugar maple charcoal. It's almost more like the old Dominic idea where they just put, you know, a, a small amount there to be able to say that they are doing their mellowing process. And um, this is also a weeded whiskey, which sets it apart from Jack Daniels, which is a high malt um, rye whiskey and um, George Dickel, which is a very heavy corn whiskey. Great to see the diversity, actually, in, in one state. Really nice baking spices come in on this one. Um, there's an herbal note to it. You get kind of a, a, a very sweet caramel. It's not out front, but it's there. Little oak, little, little um, biscuits. Uh, I say biscuits now, I used to say yeast. But um, nobody really eats yeast, so <laughs> um, biscuits makes more sense. But I think it's a smell that's probably coming from the yeast. Cheers. Mm. I love a whiskey that has a really nice grain note out front. And um, the caramel comes in there. It's peppery. Which surprises me because it's not a rye whiskey, but it almost, it, it almost comes at you with a little bit of a peppery kind of a note. Sometimes with weeded whiskeys, I expect to maybe find a cherry note in there. Not really getting that. Some nice um, juiciness, that pepper lingers. Part of it is kind of going dry on me, but there's still that lingering... Uh, kind of toffee uh, flavor that's there that keeps it from going too dry uh, at the end. It's earthy. It's one of those whiskeys that it's better the second mouthful. The first mouthful, I think you get that dry a little bit more on the finish. But don't let that dissuade you. Go back, take another taste. For me, this is one of those that, like I say, I do my judging by basically saying, is this, a, is this a whiskey I'd never buy again? Is it just okay? Is it good? Is it very good? Or is it excellent? I don't move the meter on that because of price. So take that into account. Because for a $30 whiskey, this is a really good bargain whiskey. 
And so I think that mission accomplished on that. Putting it against all the other whiskeys, um, it's a good whiskey. It is a good whiskey, but I, I mean, I'm not going to jump its praise up beyond that. It's just a, it is a good whiskey. It's a great price point. And so if you want something that's highly drinkable and has some flavors going on in it and, um, you know, it has, has a good character to it, but it's, it's, I mean, it's not going to change the world, but it's something that, you know, it's got a historic factor to it too. They found the old recipe that their uh, great, great, great grandfather, I don't know if we got enough greats in there or too many, um, Charles Nelson, they, they got his original recipe. So that's what you're drinking here. And so you're really turning the clock back to um, what people were drinking in the 19th century. And for $30 a bottle, I mean, how many times can you go back to the 19th century for $30 a bottle? So here you go. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something along the way. And um, please, uh, if, if you enjoyed the video, like it. That helps other people find the video. And uh, subscribe if you'd like to see more of these videos. Ring the bell if you actually are like, I, I, gotta, I can't wait for the next episode. And uh, leave comments because I love comments as well. And uh, thanks for joining me. Until next time, cheers and slán Yeah, that grain note. I like it. Ooh, pepper.